A couple of weeks ago, I woke up in the morning thinking of the phrase, you can't redo life. And I thought, you know, that really is true, that we can't redo life, so why don't we get it right the first time? So I decided to speak on the parables, a few messages on the most prominent parables that Jesus Christ told. And today we get to his first parable, getting conversion right. I have three objectives in this message today, and I hope that by God's grace we reach all of them. The first one is to help us to understand how conversion really happens, how a person is converted to Christ. And there's a great deal of mystery connected with it, of course, so we don't know everything, but how does it happen from our standpoint that people are saved? And another uh, goal that I have is this, to encourage you to witness to others and to let you know that your witness for Christ is not wasted, even if it appears to be wasted, perhaps in the giving of it. And finally, I'm preaching this message because I want to confront you personally and ask you whether or not you have really been converted. A couple of years ago when we took a tour to the sites of the Apostle Paul, we were on a Greek island, I forget which one it was, and I saw this big sign that said, genuine fake jewelry. Seriously. In fact, Rebecca took a picture of it. And I asked somebody, genuine fake jewelry? They said, yeah, that's a perfectly good sign. They said that everybody knows that what is sold here is fake, but there are some that are more fake than others. So this is genuine fake jewelry. So I want to, you to know that uh, one of my goals is to confront you with the question of whether or not you are a genuine fake or an ungenuine fake Christian. However that comes out, I want you to be a real Christian, born again, converted. Now the parable that we are looking at is in the fourth chapter of Mark. Mark chapter 4, where Jesus is speaking to the disciples. We must understand that according to verses uh, 10 and following, he gives an explanation as to why he speaks in parables. And he says he does that for two reasons. First of all, to conceal truth from those who rejected him and are not interested in the truth anyway. If we were to read the third chapter, we'd discover that Jesus, after doing many miracles, was accused, actually, of uh, being uh, demon-possessed. They said that he is possessed by Beelzebul. This is in chapter 3, verse 22. He is possessed by Satan. What a conclusion to come to. And so what happens is Jesus begins to withdraw from the multitude to spend time with his disciples who accepted him, and yet he's speaking to a large crowd here when he gives this parable. And uh, for those who are interested in the truth, it will lead them to more truth. For those who are disinterested in the truth, it will simply confuse them and turn them off. So Jesus said that the purpose of parables is to conceal the truth from those who don't want to hear it, but to open the truth to reveal it to those who are interested in following him. So it has a twofold purpose, a purpose of instruction, but also a purpose of judgment. Now there are dozens of parables. Some of them are only one verse long. This is one of the longer parables, and thankfully Jesus gives us the interpretation so we are not left to ourselves to interpret it. But it's one that uh, we have heard read, but I shall read it again, picking up in verse 3 of chapter 4. Listen, and by the way, that becomes so important because Jesus is going to say, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. There are some people who get it, and there are some people who don't get it. And listening 
means that we actually hear and understand. We don't just simply hear words. So, in the words of Jesus, listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some, fee, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And when the sun arose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. He who has ears to hear, listen carefully, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Please listen carefully, because Jesus urges us to. Now, when the disciples were alone, he, uh, they said, they asked him about the parable, and he says in verse 14, the sower sows the word. So now we're going to interpret the parable. First of all, about the seed itself. The seed is the word of God. The gospel that Jesus Christ was proclaiming, the message of the kingdom that was breaking in onto Satan's kingdom and rescuing people from the grip of Satan and his power. It is the word of God. And if you ask the question what you need to know in order to receive the word, that will become a little clearer later on in this message. But notice that um, the seed is the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that we are converted not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word is a seed because the word has life. You hold the seeds in your hand, and when you plant them, they grow and they reproduce themselves. Why? Because within them is life. And within God's word, there is life that can speak to your soul and transform you when the seed dwells within. Now, uh, before you begin to sow, you should ask yourself the question, what harvest do I want? Because if we want the right harvest, we must seed the Word of God, and we must do so correctly. If you have a theory of Christianity regarding health and wealth, that if you believe on Jesus, you're going to get all of these blessings as if that's the gospel, then you will reap an entirely different crop. And unfortunately, it will be a bad and bitter harvest. So the seed is the Word of God which germinates within our hearts and bears fruit. But now let us notice also the sower. Jesus says, a sower went out to sow. Well, the ultimate sower, of course, would be Jesus Christ himself, wouldn't it? It's Jesus doing the sowing. But you and I sow, and we sow by our witness. And when we sow the gospel in the lives of other people, we do so, first of all, in faith. We do it in faith because sometimes we don't see any results. Now, in those days, the way in which a sower sowed is, he had a pouch that he carried around his waist. And he would take some grain and then broadcast it, scatter it upon the earth. And uh, he uh, scattered it everywhere, hoping that it would grow everywhere. But as we'll see in a moment, it doesn't grow everywhere. But he does it in faith because when he goes back the next day, there's no evidence that anything has happened. And he begins to wonder whether or not his sowing is profitable, whether or not it produces the good and necessary result. He really doesn't know. Maybe later on he might, but for the time being, he doesn't know whether his sowing produced fruit or not. And that's the way it is when we share the gospel. 
That's the way it is when we preach and we teach. We don't, we don't necessarily see evidence that what we are doing is transforming lives, but we are trusting and believing in faith that in God's good time, lives will be changed and transformed. So we sow in faith. You know, when we were building the CLC, the Christian Life Center, it was easy to measure growth. It was easy to see what we were building. Every week was different. Every month we could see advancement. But it's not quite like that when we're dealing with people, is it? We don't see the changes. They may be imperceptible, and those changes may be in the future. So he sows in faith, but also he sows in partnership. You remember the Apostle Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians, there was an argument in the church as to who was greater, whether it was Paul or whether it was Apollos. Apollos apparently was a great orator, and people loved to hear him preach. And Paul says, don't divide the body over personalities. He says, I planted, Apollos came along and watered, but it is God who gives the increase. Very seldom, very seldom do you and I share the gospel and somebody immediately believes unless they have been prepared by others for that moment. Some plant, some water, but ultimately, whether or not the seed germinates is up to God, isn't it? So you have the sower, you have the seed, and now the soils, which is really the heart of this parable. Let's look at the different soils, four of them. Jesus here is explaining why it is that the same people who hear messages, that is to say, people hear the same message, but they respond differently. Have you ever wondered why it is that a person can listen to hundreds of sermons and not believe on Jesus? It's happened. I knew a man who went to church regularly, listening to pretty good preaching, listening to the gospel, and uh, when it came time for him to die, they had no assurance at all. Nobody in his family had any assurance at all that he had really believed on Jesus. Have you ever wondered why that is? Jesus is going to explain it right now. So he says, uh, first of all, he says that uh, the sower sows the word, verse 14, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Wow. The man is uh, sowing wheat, let's say, and he's broadcasting it, and some of it falls on the path, and the path is very hard. Why is the path hard? First of all, because a path is a place where people have trampled. And I suppose that there is no heart as hard as those who are rebelling against other Christians who have trampled on them. Like a young person who says, I hate my dad, therefore I hate his God. And so his heart is hardened. The other reason, of course, why people have hard hearts is because they feel very comfortable with their sins and with themselves. And so in the midst of this comfort, they don't want to change. They don't want to have God break into their lives. They are very content with who they are. But notice this. Isn't this remarkable? Imagine the spiritual battle that is going on when we share the gospel. There are those, Jesus said in the parable, the birds come and they devour the seed. And here he says that those birds are Satan who snatches the word of God from people's minds. Always remember that your mind is a spiritual substance, not a physical substance. It would be wrong to say, you know, I had a thought that was nearly a third of a uh, centimeter long and weighed a tenth of a gram. Your thoughts and your mind exists in the realm of spirit, and if our minds are not protected, Satan can actually enter into them, as he did in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. He put ideas into their minds that they thought were their own, and so they felt comfortable to lie and to deceive. 
if Satan had come to them with fury saying, I'm the devil and I want you to deceive the church, they would have never, never fallen for that. But they were comfortable because they thought that this was their idea. But notice, Satan comes and snatches the word. That's the only way you can explain some people who when you share the good news of the gospel with them over and over again, they just don't get it. The word of God is snatched from their minds. Realize that we have a spiritual battle when we share God's word. So that's the first category. Obviously, we can describe them as having a hard heart. That's the hard heart. Well, now we come to another category, and that is the shallow heart. Let's read on. You'll notice he says that um, regarding the shallow heart, I think it's in verse 16, and these are the ones who are sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And when they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while, then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Uh, these are uh, those who uh, hear the word of God and they receive it with joy because they say to themselves, I feel guilty, this is a way out of my guilt. Or perhaps they hear a message that tells them that Jesus has certain benefits connected with him if we believe in him. And uh, the problem is that they really don't have the soil that causes the grain to germinate and to grow. And so, uh, interestingly, the, these are the people who bring most joy to the sower. He sows and they instantly receive it with joy. They say to themselves, this is wonderful, and they receive it. But when persecution arises, when difficulties come, they say, I believed in Jesus, at least I prayed a prayer, but I didn't know that I was getting myself into something that was as transforming as it really is. And so they back away. I don't think that these people were genuinely converted. I think the best example probably is those who go forward in a meeting and they say the right prayer and they do it, but somehow it is only in the head and it is not in the heart. And so because it never reaches the level of the heart, the seed is in the mind, but they never savingly believe in Christ. I think the first two categories here are unconverted people. But now we go on to a third category that is even more interesting. I don't know how to interpret this uh, from this standpoint. I've called it a worldly heart, category number three, maybe a divided heart. You can give your own label to them. But let's look at what it says now in verse 18. It says, um, and others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. One of the things that we learned out on the farm was that uh, you never have to sow weeds. And in our lives, we never have to sow thorns. They always want to come up. So here's a person who has the right kind of soil. He really does. He receives the word of God. It falls into his life and germinates. Now, I differ from most interpreters at this point because most people, most commentaries that you read will say that uh, these people also are not true Christians. But I've known Christians who fit this category. Jesus doesn't want us to build a whole theological case on these parables. He's after a certain point. But um, you'll notice that what, uh, what the thorns are are the cares of this world. 
The cares of this world, yes, true believers, but just uh, continuing to earn as much money as they can. You'll notice the deceitfulness of riches, deceitfulness of riches because remember money makes all the same promises God does. The desire for other things consumes them and it's not that riches are wrong or the desire for other things, but it becomes so all-consuming that God is crowded out and they give him the leftovers and, and they're not fruitful. Now, I believe that every Christian bears at least some fruit, but there are some Christians who, I might say, bear very little fruit of the Spirit because they are overwhelmed by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and a desire for other things. And so their lives are basically unfruitful. Maybe it is true that this category has never really believed on Christ, even though the word seems to have germinated. But ask yourself as a Christian, is this a picture of who you are? Ask yourself that. But now we come to category number four, and that's what we've been waiting for, isn't it? But those, verse 20, that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold. Now, you know, I was born on a wheat farm. We had some cattle, but primarily we uh, grew wheat and some oats maybe also some wild oats at times, at least my brother. But um, I know something about planting. We thought that for every bushel of wheat that we planted, if we got 30 bushels in return, that was really great. If we got 40, 50 was unusual and only happened every once in a while. Now, Jesus here is saying uh, 30-fold, hey, that's great. 30-fold, uh, 60-fold, that's, that's beyond the limit. 100-fold, there's no way that you could expect to get 100-fold. There may be some things that you get 100-fold in. Usually it's weeds, not wheat or oats or barley. But Jesus said that the life where the soil was good doesn't mean that we as humans are good. It means that the soil received a wonderful welcome and was deeply rooted, that that soil bore fruit. And by the way, that's the only soil that really has the assurance of salvation. It's the only real evidence that you and I have that somebody has been converted when they become fruit-bearing Christians and we begin to see evidence of the new life that God has implanted within them. Now what I'd like to do is to give you three lessons that I hope that you never forget. It's easy for us to forget, but don't let Satan snatch this out of your mind. First of all, notice this that even though all of the soils received the same seed, only one really bore the fruit God intended. And that means that there are degrees of receptivity for the Word of God. Today I'm preaching to a lot of people here at the Moody Church, many who have joined us by way of the internet, this message is going to be on the radio, God willing, and will be heard by many thousands of people. And, and there's going to be a variety of responses. Some are going to say, yes, I get it. I understand. And those are the Christians who say, I know that my roots are real, that the gospel has done its work in my life. Others are going to blow it off and simply say, we've heard all this before. And they are uninterested because their hearts are hard. This past week I met a man who debates atheists. I wish I had met this man a few months before, before I debated an atheist a few months ago. And uh, he said this, he always asks atheists this question. I love it. 
He says, if I ask you two questions, will you give me an honest answer? And they say, of course, yes. And the first question is, will you give me an honest answer to question number two? <laughs> Every atheist, of course, says yes, because remember, atheists also are created in the image of God. And because they're created in the image of God, they have a sense of morality, a conscience, etc. Their conscience and their morality did not come from atheism, but it comes from the fact that they are God's special creation in his image. So they always say yes. And then he asks them this question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Most of them think about it for a moment, and some of them say no. Well, what's this debate all about here? How much evidence would it take to convince you? The answer is none, because even if it were true, you wouldn't become a Christian. In other words, it does not matter. The evidence is irrelevant. And what that means is a hard, determined heart. But let's not think that that's relegated to atheists. It's relegated to church people who uh, are willing to come and listen but are indifferent to God and indifferent to the gospel. And so please keep in mind that when we speak about hard hearts, it doesn't mean somebody who's angry. It means somebody who's comfortable without God's forgiveness and grace as it is found in Jesus. So please keep that in mind. The response is different in the lives of different people. Secondly, um, uh, second lesson, and that is that it is the Word of God, the Gospel, which will become clear in a moment, it is the Word of God that produces the miracle, not the sower. The sower who sowed the seed may not have been dressed too well, he may not be very educated, but ultimately, if the miracle is going to happen, it's going to happen because the Word of God, the seed, fell onto soil that was willing to receive it and accept it. That's really the key to witnessing. Now, I might say that sometimes the sower gets in the way of the seed. If you're going to sow the good news of the gospel to those with whom you work, your friends and so forth, don't, don't trample on them at the same time because, as I mentioned, those who were along the path, that path was hard because many people had walked over it. So the integrity of the sower oftentimes is important for the receiver to accept. But at the same time, when the miracle actually happens, that miracle is really a miracle that the seed does. The Word does what you and I cannot do. It is the miracle of regeneration. It is the Word of God. And we don't know how that is, do we? In another parable, Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like unto a man who sows seeds in a field, and then he goes and sleeps. And after a number of sleeps, he comes back and he sees that there is growth, but he doesn't understand how it happens. And I don't understand how you can have one little seed of something that is very small and you plant it and then you get 30 or 40 or 100 back. I don't understand that. I don't understand how the Holy Spirit of God works in a heart and brings about conversion or regeneration. I don't understand that, but I do know that the Word does its work, and we are born again by the Word of God. And so um, God often uses very imperfect sowers. I love that story. You know, in the 1800s, there was a great preacher in England by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. One time when he was about 18 years old, as I remember the story, Spurgeon went to a church and it was snowing so hard, he trudged through the snow, and it snowed so much that the pastor never made it to the church himself. 
So a layperson stood up and read the phrase from Isaiah, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. He read that text a couple of times, made a few comments, and that was it. And that word stuck in Spurgeon's heart and soul and led him to conversion. It's not a matter of saying, oh, I don't witness because I don't have all the answers or I'm not polished. No, what we need to do is to give people the word of God. Now there's a third lesson. Only God, only God can take the soil and change its consistency. Only God can really take the soil and change it. Because a question you should be asking in this message is, uh, what about the hard soil? Can it ever be plowed so that it becomes soft and pliable? The answer is yes. We should never think that somebody is locked into hardness. God is able to take soil and change it. Now, one of the things I learned, and Colin Smith preached on this passage, and he brought it out, and I totally agree with him, is that in those days what they would do is to seed the Word of God, or seed the seeds, I should say, and broadcast it over a piece of land. And only after that did they plow it. They didn't plow it ahead of time. They plowed it afterwards, and so they plowed it under so that it would begin to grow. Now here's the reason why you and I should be witnessing and sharing the Word of God is that as we give it out to people, we have no idea when God may decide to plow whose life he may begin to plow up so that they can receive the word of God. Maybe they can't when we give it to them, but the time may come when they will. And how does God do that? Well, I don't know all the ways that God does it, but I do know that there are times when a person feels as if he uh, needs God, maybe an awareness of God. It may be tragedy. If somebody comes into your room, if a doctor comes into your room and says, you know, you've got six months to live, that may cause you to begin to think, you know, my heart has been hard toward God, but maybe, maybe I should listen to God's word. God comes along and plows. And the reason that you and I should sow seed is we do not know where he will plow next. Now, sometimes God goes ahead of us and, and prepares the soil so that when the word comes, it falls into good soil immediately. Now let me tell you a story. Two weeks ago today, Rebecca and I were on a train going to Prague in the Czech Republic. We were with two other couples. And when you buy tickets on a train, you are given, uh, you know, the place where you're going to sit and so forth. So we were given six seats and we arbitrarily chose them. We couldn't sit together. One group went there. I and another man, we chose some seats. I found myself directly across. You know how those trains are. The seats face one another. I found myself uh, across from a young woman who had headphones, and I asked her whether or not she could speak English, and she said yes. I asked her where she was from. She said, Moravia. I said, do you know the story of the Moravians? You know, they were the ones who went from the Czech Republic to Germany and sent 265 missionaries around the world. No, she'd not heard of the Moravians. And, I said, they spread the gospel, and she said, what, what do you mean by the gospel? So in less than two minutes, we were into the gospel. <laughs> now, the good news is this. I'll tell you the end of the story, and then I'll give you the process. In less than an hour, I took her by the hand and led her to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful that God did that? For all I know, she may be listening today because I encouraged her to join us here at the Moody Church online. But here's what I discovered. First of all, most of the time was spent helping her to see why she was a sinner who needed a Savior. 
Now, she was open to God, but thought that she could find God just within her, you know, the God within. She didn't need forgiveness in the biblical sense because, uh, and then she raised the issue of why can't we just come to God directly? Why do we need Jesus? I love that question. Why do we need Jesus? And so I explained to her why you can't go to God directly. You can pray to him. And he may answer your prayer, but the way in which he'll answer it is he'll bring Jesus into your life in one way or another very quickly because Jesus is the mediator between God and man and the only one qualified to take away this issue of sin. Now she said she was defining sin as the big things, murder, you know, theft, etc., etc. When I began to help her to see that our nature was corrupt, I said, you know, we as human beings are something like fish in a sea that say, I don't see any water. You know, where's the water? What do you mean by water? And you're swimming in it. So that helped her along the way. But here's why I tell you the story. God prepared the soil. She said a year ago, and it's a year ago this coming month, she was walking along a pier and fell down and she said there was blood for two meters. I'm not sure exactly what all that meant, but she was picked up basically for dead. She was taken to a hospital, and in the hospital, after being in a coma for I forget how many hours, she recovered. But the doctor said that she should be written up in the Guinness Book of World Records because they have no idea why she lived. As a matter of fact, when she was there in the hospital, she actually, her soul left her body so that she could see herself lying there from the corner of the room, which helps us to understand the separability of the soul from the body. But she came back to life and she said that uh, there were people who came into her room just to look at her and to say, we don't understand why you are alive. So she said to me, why didn't I die? Oh, love those questions. <laughs> I took her by the hand and said, you didn't die because you weren't ready to die. God knew that at some time I would sit across from you in this train and explain to you how you can come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and be ready to die. So afterwards, she was ready to struggling, of course, with how to pray. So I explained the prayer that I would pray in detail, what she was admitting to, that she was a sinner, that she couldn't save herself, that Jesus died for sinners, and that he made a path to us so that he could take away our sins and give us the righteousness of Christ. I said, would you like to believe on Jesus? She said, that would be wonderful if you'd help me too. Now, only time will tell whether or not she fits into soil A. I know for sure that she isn't in the first soil because her heart was not hard. I trust that she did not belong to soil number two that received the word with gladness. I hope that she fell into good soil and I received an email this week from the folks in the Czech Republic with whom we connected that they have followed up with her, they've connected with her a couple of times by email and are helping her to find a church in Prague and to be discipled. I hope and pray that she will be the fourth soil that bears fruit forever. But I tell you that to let you know that God went ahead and, and he plowed the soil and he brought into her life circumstances that made her ready to believe on Christ. And maybe today, those of you who are watching by internet or listening on the radio or those of you here in the sanctuary of Moody Church, God has brought you to this moment, to this hour, for this reason that you might savingly believe on Christ, that the word of God coming into your heart might be so received that it creates the life of God. And you'll begin to love Jesus You'll begin to display the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. And you'll say to yourself, surely 
I know God. And the fruit that you will bear, you'll never see here on earth. And that guy who led Spurgeon to faith in Christ because of that one or two sentence sermon that he preached, he had no idea that that 18 year old in the congregation was going to be one of the most famous preachers in history. You have no idea the impact you have when you sow the seed. Get your colleagues at work to read the book of John and just say to them, even if you don't believe it, read it and ask yourself, who is this Jesus anyway? Get the word in their hearts. God will come along and plow the field. and Someday they'll bear fruit, 40, 60, or 100-fold. Did God intend this message for you this morning? I hope so. To encourage you to share the word or for those of you who are not sure, to bring you to openness and receive Christ. Would you join me as we pray together? Father, uh, today we thank you. We thank you for the gospel. And I, I pray, Father, for those who perhaps fit into category number two or three. They've received the word, maybe even with gladness, or it is growing among the thorns, and we don't know whether they're converted or not, and they don't know whether they're converted or not. Today, Father, open their hearts to the gospel. And even as I prayed with a 32-year-old young woman on a train, I pray that in this moment, you can repeat this prayer after me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. Today, I understand that Jesus is a Savior, and I receive him as my Savior. I trust him to forgive my sins. I trust him by his spirit to come to live within me and to change me by his word. Today, Father, I pray that you will put me on a path of being a fruit-bearing Christian, 30, 60, or a hundredfold. Father, help all who have prayed that prayer and those who haven't but should. In Jesus' name, amen. By his word. Today, Father, I pray that you will put me on a path of being a fruit.